Thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to be able to share with you this evening uh, a little background on the Air Peninsula Railways. Uh, it is indeed an honour to be here. Uh, you mentioned the, the book that was produced. Um, I must say, to start with, that I never had any intention of writing a book or becoming an author or anything along those lines. What I wanted to do originally was build a model railway. That was 17 years ago. Uh, I decided to build an historically accurate model of Minipa Railway Yard as it existed in the 1960s. I quickly found that, unlike most other railway lines in, in South Australia, almost nothing had been published about the Air Peninsula lines. So I began at the beginning, and my surprisingly very supportive wife Maggie and I began the task of primary research. And before very long, uh, the task widened from just Minipa to the whole of Air Peninsula, uh, because the centenary of the Port Lincoln Lines was coming up in 2007. So uh, the end result was a history book on the railways of Air Peninsula and this is the, uh, the latest incarnation of that book. Um, as an aside, I must say, we, we packed a box of what we thought of these books tonight, uh, or when, when we left Port Lincoln yesterday, we opened them up this evening and found that it was the wrong box, so I'm afraid I don't have any copies here. Either. <laughs> At the end of the 19th century, Air Peninsula was a remote, sparsely populated corner of the state. The only settlements were on or close to the coastline, a result of South Australia's geography with the large gulfs and peninsulas, uh, and the use of catches and coastal shipping. The interior of Air Peninsula was home to large pastoral leases. Bull's value per tonne was high enough to justify the cost of dray haulage to the coastline over considerable distances. But wheat was quite the opposite and, and that restricted its commercial viability to within 20 or so miles of the coast or a navigable river. The clamour for more agri agricultural land in the state turned the attention to the Murray Mallee and to the Air Peninsula regions. Oh, sorry, I, that's the model. <laughs> um, the building of railways into these areas would change the economics for agriculture completely and an ongoing program of turning pastoral leases into smaller agricultural holdings was begun. As railway lines were built into these areas, hundreds were surveyed and opened up for selection. In the space of 30 years, the face of Air Peninsula changed dramatically. Railway maps of South Australia in the 19th century showed a number of isolated lines, all reaching out from small coastal ports. Beachport, Kingston South East, Port Wakefield, Port Broughton, Port Pirie and Port Augusta were all such gateways to isolated railways. All of these, except for the short Port Broughton to Mandura line, which closed in 1942, were eventually connected to the Adelaide-based state network. Port Lincoln was selected as the starting point of the seventh such isolated line. The Port Lincoln division of the South Australian Railways, as it became known, grew to a 670 kilometre network <coughs> But unlike its predecessors, it never linked up with the rest of the state and national network. The size of the division, along with its isolation, meant that extensive workshop facilities were provided to avoid having to ship locomotives and rolling stock backwards and forwards to Adelaide whenever repairs or heavy maintenance were needed. A culture of self-sufficiency was thus developed, and this was encouraged by the head office policy of sending redundant equipment from elsewhere to Port Lincoln. Even the rails for the first main line were second hand, having been used elsewhere 
for 40 years. They were available because they'd been replaced with heavier rail on the lines closer to Adelaide. The locals became very expert at adapting and modifying whatever was on, at hand to meet new needs. This is a family tree, just as an example, showing some, uh, some rolling stock. Down the bottom, we've got four vehicles that existed in 1985. All of these are component vehicles of some sort with bodies or underframes modified again and again and handed down over the years. Um, as I said, the earliest ancestor vehicle up here was 1863. Nothing was ever wasted. The other side to this was that things often happened at Port Lincoln, such as total reconstruction of rolling stock, which was never reported back to head office. <laughs> From a historian's point of view, the disconnect between official records and reality makes research very difficult. It also means that it is important for us to record as much as possible of the reality history now, while the people and local supporting information are still with us. Now let's go back to 1905. The Taylor Bend to Pinaroo railway line was under construction and the government of the day was convinced that construction of pioneer lines such as this would guarantee the success of agricultural settlement in large areas of Mallee Scrub. They were called pioneer lines because of their cheap standard of construction. Limited earthworks following the contours of the land, no ballast and second-hand rails on new sleepers. Speeds would be low as a result and only very light locomotives could be used. But that wasn't regarded as a problem. They would be upgraded in the future when circumstances warranted it. Yeah, they actually believed that. <laughs> With the Murray Mallee experiment underway, attention was turned to the vast expanses on Air Peninsula. It was hailed as a new province for South Australia, needing only a railway to make it happen. The short 42 mile line was constructed from Port Lincoln to Cummins. That was in 1907. Expansion followed and by 1926, the lines reached through the centre of the peninsula, out to Seguna and Thevenard and on to Penong. Also from Cummins up Eastern Air Peninsula to Kimba and Buckleboo and a short <coughs> branch line out here, out to Mount Hope. Um, and despite the name Mount Hope, it was a hopeless line that had virtually any, no traffic its whole life. Um, and Dr. Rhys Jennings uh, had a lot of rather uncomplimentary things to say about the Mount Hope line, and I'm sure he's absolutely right. As the hundreds were settled, dog fences were constructed in many districts to protect livestock. The fences intersected the railway at 10 locations across the peninsula. Several designs of pit were tried, but the dingoes simply walked along the railhead past the fence. Gates were then provided at each crossing. Trains had to stop, the guard opened the gate, the train, train pulled through, sorry, the fireman opened the gate, the train moved through, the guard closed the gate and then the train continued. Spare gates were provided at each one in case the train didn't stop in time. <laughs> it was very important to make sure that the fence wasn't breached. Eventually larger areas were enclosed by further, further fences and as that happened these gates were no longer required. The Port Lincoln lines were constructed to pioneer standard, as we call it, but that adject adjective could also be applied to the railways in another context. Port Lincoln, Seduna and Penong were the only townships served by the railway which predated the coming of the railway. All the other townships were created as a result of the lines being extended through each area. 
the railway pioneered the establishment of inland townships, even in those areas close to the coast which had already been surveyed and where settlement on individual sections had begun. The opening up of Air Peninsula really did provide an exciting opportunity for land planners in the state on a vast scale. As the lines were extended and new hundreds were surveyed, provision was made for railway sidings and township sites at frequent intervals, typically every five, five miles or so. It was government policy at the time to leave no wheat farm more than 15 miles from a railway, the coast or the River Murray. Sidings were not actually built at all the locations at the start. Many were built later to fill the gaps between the original sidings, with 25 additional ones opened by 1935. Some, as you can see on this, this uh, 100 map, were never actually developed. A small number of private townships were created adjacent to railway sidings, but most were government townships. No one could predict which ones would thrive or would, which would not. So provision was made at each location for growth well beyond the immediate needs. The parkland town design was popular in this period and this influence was reflected in the surveys of many locations. Given the unique circumstances of, of each township being established as the railway was built, the half parkland variants, variant was popular. The parkland design was cut in half. The townships are laid along one side of the railway. Some locations had a triangle for turning steam locomotives and this occupied land on the opposite side of the railway to the township. And that avoided the railway protruding into the street pattern. This example, of course, is Minipa, which was, became a significant railway centre from 1913 right up to the 1980s. Sometimes the railway siding and the adjacent townships were given different names. The private survey for Bellwood was adjacent to Yelana Station. After a few years, the township adopted the Yelana name. Another example was Carapy Township beside Dark Speak Station. Again, the, town, the railway's name was adopted by the township after a few years. And this name was in turn altered in 1950 shortened to Dark Peak because the railways had an ongoing program of eliminating possessives from station names. Not all surveyed townships actually developed. Some saw a handful of buildings erected and others were never established and in some cases the survey was subsequently cancelled. For example, Malte was surveyed in 1960 16, as a township of 34 allotments, 26 and a half acres of parkland. A hall and a school occupied just two of the lots. When the Penong Line was built in the 1920s, townships were surveyed for a string of locations along that line. Each was given 30 or so allotments, a school reserve and a large recreational reserve. Aside from the occasional school building, one would never know that these substantial settlements were even contemplated. There are other similar examples scattered all the way across the peninsula. Railways Commissioner William Webb transformed the SAR in the 1920s, dragging the organisation reluctantly out of its 19th century mindset and practices. He stepped on plenty of toes in the process, but did succeed in establishing a very forward-thinking culture in the railways. One of his innovations was an extensive program to provide railway-owned employee cottages in locations where housing was unavailable or problematic. Most locations on Air Peninsula were certainly in that category. Track gangs were stationed at regular intervals along the line, so even places like Malti had three railway cottages. It should be noted that these cottages were generally built on nominal alignment
improvements within the railway boundary and not on the town lots. Hence, a siding may have had several of these cottages and they may have constituted the entire township. If the official surveyed allotments were vacant, then the township theoretically did not exist, except on paper. Right from the start, the railway timetable on Air Peninsula was coordinated with the schedules of the coastal shipping which served Port Lincoln. A weekly service was provided and in the 1920s, Adelaide steamships SS Wandana was the regular vessel. Overcrowding had become a, a serious issue, so the much-loved MV Minipa was introduced in 1927. This, vehicle made, this vessel made two return trips a week between Port Link, Adelaide and Port Lincoln. In 1929, the railway timetable was revised to match, and from then on until the end of railway passenger services in 1968, the same basic sap pattern of services applied. And this is the origin of Air Peninsula people referring to Adelaide as being on the mainland. The only way you got there was by ship, so we must be on an island. <laughs> and that term is actually still used a lot by locals today. At first, all services were provided by mixed trains. These were freight trains hauled by a steam locomotive with one or two passenger carriages at the rear. One could not be in a hurry when travelling by train, although there was no real alternative. The Port Lincoln to Feminard service was a good example of what had to be endured. Leaving Port Lincoln at 9am 9, 9 on Wednesdays, after connecting with the Wandana, the train would shunt wagons on and off as needed at every siding along the way. Minipa, all of 157 miles away, was reached at 7.35 p.m., give or take an hour or two. Everyone spent the night there and rejoined the train the next morning for a 9 a.m. departure. And from there, the, the extra 122 miles from there to Thevenard were covered at a similar leisurely pace, arriving there at 5.13 p.m. on Thursday. Note the accuracy in the timetable, 5.13 p.m., despite the fact that the train actually ran to something like an approximation of the timetable. The return journey was slightly faster, taking all of Friday and a fair bit of Saturday to make connection with the Wanderer in Port Lincoln. I have a quote here from uh, a lady, Mary Beard, talking about riding on, the, uh, on a mixed train. My mother always said she had never been on a gee whiz funfair machine. But after she had ridden from Lock to Cummins to attend the show in a carriage attached to the back of the train, she had. It really swayed from side to side, jerked forward and backwards and bounced up and down all at the same time. <laughs> Our previously mentioned Commissioner Webb was horrified at this arrangement when he made his first inspection visit to Air Peninsula and ordered the introduction of a real passenger train. This train conveyed only passenger carriages and even had the luxury of a sleeping car. Port Lincoln departure was now 10 a.m. on Wednesdays with Thevenard reached at 2.14 a.m. on Thursday, dispensing with the Minipa overnight stop. On the return trip, Departure from Thevenard was 4 a.m. Saturday, with Port Lincoln reached at 8 p.m. same day. We assume that the Thevenard sleeping car passengers were allowed to settle themselves in the night before and not, not wait for the 4 a.m. departure to join the train. No official instructions were issued on this, but it would almost certainly have been local practice. A new fleet of self-propelled rail cars which are passenger carriages with their own engines and space for luggage and parcels, had revolutionised country passenger services in the rest of the state in the 1920s. They were faster than steam trains and operationally more flexible and much more economical to run. Would they be provided for a peninsula? 
but not likely. The policy of only sending redundant equipment to the West Coast was applied in a very blatant way in this instance. The SAR had dabbled in road buses in the 1920s, running their own buses to places such as Victor Harbour and Gawler to compete not with, just with their own trains, but with other buses which had been stealing the railway's passengers. This ended in 1931, when road transport controls were introduced. The railways thus had redundant road buses, but Air Peninsula had nothing that could be called a road network. The solution was to take some of the buses and convert them to run on rails. Four of the 1928-built Fagel safety coaches were rebuilt with for narrow gauge and shipped to Port Lincoln, along with some specially built lightweight parcels trailers. They were not exactly comfortable. Having, having solid steel wheels instead of rubber road tyres, the ride was notoriously rough. But in true Port Lincoln make-do style, the last of them was still carrying passengers up to 1961. Locals began referring to the rail car service as the bus, for obvious reasons. And that name also stuck and was used uh, until the end of the passenger services, basically for all of the passenger trains. A lady called Virginia, uh, Patricia Virgin, wrote a poem on the Peninsula Railways and had this little, little bit to say about the Fagels. <coughs> With a slow kalang, kalong, kalang, it grips the shiny steel and rumbles from the station. It's the train that has square wheels. The SAR did manage to rearrange things a bit on the mainland and allowed two of the newer purpose built Brill Rail cars to be set, sent to Port Lincoln in 1936 and 37. There must have been a bit of a pecking order in effect here because the arrival of the Brills allowed one of the Fagels to be cascaded to the Narrow Court Kingston line in the southeast. The joys of such a conveyance with, with us shared around a little. Although the passengers on that line were lucky enough to see the Fagel relocated to standby status just eight years later, when they also got a brill. A third brill came to Port Lincoln in 1946. No narrow gauge brills were available, so a broad gauge vehicle was fitted with narrow gauge bogies and shipped over. Easy solution. Unfortunately, its wide body fouled a lot of the goods platforms at sidings along the Air Peninsula lines. So it had to be restricted to running on the main lines only. This caused never-ending headaches for the train controllers in making sure that it could safely pass other trains. But for head office, it was out of sight, out of mind. And the offending rail car remained on the peninsula for the rest of its working life. For the residents of the agricultural areas, the railway was their lifeline. Everything came and went by train. The rail cars, of course, carried passengers, a traffic which peaked around school holidays and other special occasions, but was variable at other times. Their real value was in the mail and parcels traffic. Huge quantities of these were offloaded from the ship and stacked in the rail cars and trailers for distribution as the rail cars fanned out across the peninsula. Foodstuffs not produced locally, New clothing and sewing materials, household items, farm machinery, parts, firearms, even fresh flowers for weddings came this way, usually mail ordered. The mail itself was particularly welcome. Going to town to meet the rail car or to meet the bus was a community event. People would dress up and use the opportunity to chat to friends and neighbours. The returning rail cars also had important tasks apart from carrying passengers. Many farmers' wives sent fresh cream and eggs to Cummins and Port Lincoln, providing a little extra income to help with finances. Fresh fish in ice crates 
came from, by rail car from the fishing fleet at Thevenard to Port Lincoln, and then by ship in a refrigerated compartment to Port Adelaide. From there, the fish went by express train to Melbourne to feed the hungry masses there. Of course, quite often the ice wasn't enough, and by the time the fish got to Melbourne, it wasn't edible. <laughs> Kitty Domagalski uh, lived at Woodna in the 1950s, and she has uh, a very evocative description of what life at the station was like when the rail car was due. As was the custom, a large group of people began to gather at Woodna Railway Station. Schoolboys just dismissed from school raced each other, either on foot or by bicycle. Older men, mostly farmers, stood about yarning and smoking. Several schoolgirls in a group gossiped and giggled. They all had one thing in common, waiting for the rail car. At the northern end of the station building were the refreshment rooms. Here Mrs Johnston carried out her last minute chores, setting out the teacups, sandwiches, cakes, and her delicious homemade hot pies. Behind her, husband Bill was in charge of the boiling water. Tea was to be made in a large pot, just at the right moment to be served fresh to tired and thirsty customers. The journey had begun at Port Lincoln that morning after the arrival of the Minima from Adelaide, when all the cargo, freight, travellers and their luggage were safely aboard. Lunchtime refreshments had been available at Cummins, 65 kilometres from Port Lincoln. The junior porter set the signal. From the open level crossing south of town, the rail car driver blasted the hooter, which was acknowledged by the porter waving a green flag, a signal that all was clear and it was safe for the vehicle to proceed. Now the station became a hive of activity. A low, flat, four-wheel hand trolley was positioned beside the door of the freight van. As the passengers alighted and the guard handed the freight down to the porter, he loaded it onto the trolley. Empty cream cans and egg crates, tea chests of groceries and stock for the local businesses, fruit, vegetables, large ins insulated cans of ice cream, boxes of day-old chickens, and what's this? A brand new bedhead for someone, and tied in a bundle, several new rifles. Don't point those things this way, lad, said a farmer. Who are they for anyway? asked another. Probably for the bloke who's getting married here tomorrow, replied, <laughs> replied the guard, handing down a box of white flowers. The girl who had stood apart stepped forward and took the box from him. Here, be careful with those. Here, be careful with those. I'm the bride. <laughs> the rail cars were also in demand for special charters. Football clubs used them in the early years for away games at other towns. Specials usually ran for events such as picnic outings, agricultural shows and race meetings. Items which are too big for the rail cars came by freight train. Fertilisers, tractors, agricultural machinery, new water tanks and feed bins, even new cars and trucks. And of course the products of the land were picked up at every siding and taken to one of the two ports, predominantly wheat and barley, but also some livestock and wool. In other parts of the state, the SAR provided specially equipped baby health carriages for the Mothers and baby, Babies Health Association travelling sisters, and these were moved between settlements by regular trains. Such luxuries were never provided on Air Peninsula. Instead, the sister was given a gold pass and had to make her way from place to place as best she could. Her itinerary was partly by rail car, partly by goods train, and partly by being driven by local volunteers. But in an area with scarce medical help, this was a vital service which the railways nonetheless brought to the inland townships. Train services were not the only aspect of the railways which sustained the early communities. The railways installed Morse telegraph lines 
to all sidings, followed eventually by voice lines. The railway voice circuits were not exactly high tech. One pair of wires ran from Port Lincoln to Thevenard and Penong. Another pair ran from Port Lincoln to Buckleboo. These were party lines, and each siding had its unique bell code, which the staff were meant to listen for. This arrangement was used right up to 1989. The railway voice lines were often the only such lines to a township in the early days, and provided emergency communications for the whole community. In some instances, the PMG actually rented capacity on the railway voice circuits until its own lines were extended. This allowed the communities the benefits of that wonderful new technology of the telephone well before they would otherwise have had access. Air Peninsula is particularly dry, with much of the agricultural area averaging under 15 inches of rainfall annually. The short Todd River near Port Lincoln is the only permanent watercourse on the whole peninsula. When the hundreds were surveyed, many of the new sections were provided with a, by the government with an open corrugated iron shed and a rainwater tank. The first settlers generally enclosed one end of the shed as their home and the tank provided enough water for domestic use but not much more. Catching and storing what rain fell became an art form with several techniques used by individual settlers and by the railways. Granite outcrops occurred frequently across the peninsula and catchment drains around the base of many of these directed water into covered underground tanks. At many sidings, the railways provided huge catchment sheds one or two acres of corrugated iron roof with rows of tanks under the roof. These sheds served a dual purpose as the covered space between the tanks was used for bag grain storage. In drier years, even these ingenious methods could not sustain either the steam locomotives or the needs of the settlers. The railways took water from a handful of reliable sources on Lower Air Peninsula and attached water gins behind the locomotives so that they had enough water to get to the destination and return. Special water trains were also run to supply the farmers' needs, emptying into lineside tanks placed at many sidings. We're not just talking about the early years for these either. The last water trains supplied Kimber up to January 1972. Water or more correctly, lack of it, was the other major issue apart from transport, which was holding back agriculture across Air Peninsula. The horses need on the, needed on the farms needed more water than the domestic catchments could supply, and supplementary animals such as cows, sheep and pigs were a luxury. The government carried out the ambitious Todd Water Scheme to solve the problem. A reservoir was constructed on the Todd River, with several nearby creeks also being diverted into the reservoir via aqueducts. Water from the reservoir was pumped to pressure tanks on a nearby hill, and from there a gravity main extended along the railway line all the way to Seduna. At 384 kilometres, it was the longest gravity main in the world at the time. The railways were instrumental in the pipeline's construction, conveying trainloads of pipes to work sites along the line as the pipeline was built. For much of this distance, road, rail and the pipeline shared the original three-chain corridor, swapping positions along the corridor as needed for local circumstances. Since then, branch pipelines have spread out over much of the peninsula and additional underground sources added to meet the increasing demands of the growing population. Water is, of course, still a very contentious issue on Air Peninsula. The Polder Basin was overdrawn to the point where it has virtually dried up and the volumes drawn from other basins <coughs> caused
caused considerable friction between SA Water and the locals who consider the rate unsustainable. But that's a discussion for a different time. As I mentioned earlier, the Port Lincoln Division usually received the hand-me-downs from the rest of the SAR. This meant that for its whole existence, it has been a virtual operating museum of the South Australian Railways. There have been a few bright spots when new equipment came our way. <coughs> Two passenger carriages were built new for the opening of the line in 1907. There were some newly built cattle wagons and ballast hoppers. Six bright, shiny new steel brake vans with passenger accommodation were built in 1968, just as all passenger services were cancelled. <laughs> some aluminium grain hoppers were built in 1969, and these are still in use today. And there were some new 830 class diesel electric locomotives in 1962. The first of these was the first narrow gauge diesel electric on the SAR. They were good value for money. The first two are still in use at Port Lincoln today, never having left Air Peninsula. They're kept running by the extensive workshop facilities at Port Lincoln. The vast majority of the rolling stock, though, came second-hand to Port Lincoln. In the 19th century, the SAR had purchased some passenger cars and open wagons, which ran on six wheels using the patented Clemenson system of articulation. They were found to be unsatisfactory on South Australia's pioneer standard tracks, and the passenger cars were rebuilt with conventional bogies. Rather than spend any money on the open wagons, though, they were sent to Port Lincoln. And the locals there managed to use them with surplus marine board teams on the water trains. The last of these wagons was still in existence at Port Lincoln in 1964, 50 years after being banished from the mainland. Back to Mr Commissioner Webb. He introduced a large fleet of bogey wagons and vans to the broad gauge network because they were far more efficient than the old small four-wheelers. But hundreds of four-wheel steel-bodied open wagons had recently been built for the broad gauge, with another hundred under construction. His solution? Convert them to narrow gauge and send them to Port Lincoln. They were wider than the previous narrow gauge wagons, and until people learned to unload them evenly, it was possible to overbalance the wagons and have them literally just fall over where they stood. After several occurrences like this, the staff took a little more care in how they were unloaded. A similar exercise in 1992 saw 10 large standard, grade, standard gauge grain hopper wagons converted to narrow gauge and sent to Port Lincoln. When fully loaded, they were too heavy for the light track and a propensity to overturn saw them restricted to partial loads only to lower their centre of gravity. They lasted nine years before being returned. Iron ore was exported through Darwin in the 1960s and early 70s. New locomotives and rolling stock were built for this traffic. Of course, that line was part of the Commonwealth Railways. Cyclone Tracy's destruction brought that traffic to an end. And with a few years, dozens of the iron ore hoppers were sent to Air Peninsula to re-equip the gypsum trains between, between Lake Macdonald, which is near Penong, and the port of Thevenard. Forty more iron ore hoppers were taken to port to Islington workshops in Adelaide. They were chopped in half, a new middle section and roof hatches were added, and then they were shipped to Port Lincoln for bulk grain traffic. Many are still in use today. These vehicles were not the only hand-me-downs from the North Australia line to come to Air Peninsula. Thousands of steel sleepers recovered from the territory after tracks were lifted were reused, replacing wooden sleepers in parts of Air Peninsula. Even buildings were relocated. Whole station buildings and even a station master's cottage have been dismantled and re-erected elsewhere on the division. The original engine shed and carriage shed at Port Lincoln, which were erected in 1907, 
had already seen almost 30 years' use at Kingston in the southeast when they came to Port Lincoln. They were simple, timber-framed, corrugated iron structures, and they survived well beyond anyone's expectations. The carriage shed blew down in a windstorm in 2010 and blocked the main line for four days. <laughs> and the engine shed, which you can see just beside it there, uh, was demolished just last year, 137 years after it was first erected at Kingston. Another building began as the resident engineer's office at Port Lincoln. It was relocated to Mount Hope as crew barracks and then a few years later, was sent to Thevenard for its third incarnation there. Nothing was wasted. You probably have the impression by now that with such an antiquated collection of junk, how could we possibly provide an adequate service or survive long term? But that would not be taking the determination of the railwaymen of the Port Lincoln Division into account. Isolated, and badly supported or ignored by head office, they developed a strong can-do culture. Staff transfers around the state were the normal path to advancement in the SAR. Many railwaymen exposed to the West Coast culture and lifestyle chose to remain there. This instilled a real continuity of experience in the staff and fostered strong connections with local communities. Everyone, railwaymen and the public worked together to make sure that supplies arrived and the grain was shipped. The railway family extended just beyond just the two leg employees. Clydesdale horses were used in teams as shunt engine, as shunt engines, shunt horses, <laughs> on the Port Lincoln jetty. Right up to 1951, these horses were regarded so highly that the, the details of each were faithfully recorded in the personnel register. <laughs> Derailments were commonplace on the primitive track. It was not unknown for the accident train to be diverted to a second derailment when it was returning to Port Lincoln after attending the first one. On one occasion, the same train derailed twice within a few miles on the one line. Despite all these difficulties, the division provided Air Peninsula with the transport services needed by the inland townships and ag agricultural areas. Much of the network is still in use today although services are only a fraction of those in earlier decades. The only commodities now, now hauled are bulk grain to Port Lincoln and gypsum to Thevenard. Rail clears much of the grain traffic from silos as far north as Kimber and Woodenham, although significant tonnages now also come to the port by road. Personally, I feel that Viterra have skewed the mix too far in favour of road, but again, that's a discussion for another time. The Air Peninsula Rail Network is still narrow gauge. It still has light track, which prevents modern heavier locomotives from being used. And it still uses 50-year-old wagons. But remarkably, it's the last man standing of the once extensive network of South Australian rural branch lines. As of this month, services on the Murray Mallee lines to Pinaroo and Loxton have ceased. These were the last operational branch lines on the mainland. The Port Lincoln Division is still in everyday use and it is still that rolling museum. And that's what makes this narrow gauge isolated network so intriguing.